thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to start with a few announcements. Uh, as always, we thank the Val Holland Foundation for making this possible. Um, we have still 17 days of activities, so keep track on our website. You can pick up a schedule at the front. And um, I don't think that the next guest needs much introduction. Um, so I'll just go ahead and welcome Stella Assange. And uh, it's good to see so many friendly faces here. Uh, is this working? Yes. Yep. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you've been following the last few days, but they've been really encouraging. I mean, we were, I was on the train from Amsterdam to Berlin yesterday, and it's like a six hour long journey, and I did not put down my phone. I was thinking, well, maybe I can rest a bit. No, I was just trying to keep track of all the things that were going on. Um, in, uh, on Saturday, I think it was last Saturday? Uh, no, yeah, eighth. Um, we did this action in London where we called people to show up at one o'clock and join hands and form a human chain. And it was really mind-blowing because we, this day a transport strike had been called and there were lots of people saying, no, we shouldn't do this, it won't work. Um, but people came, really came through and um, there were at least 7,000 people there. Um, and, you know, we weren't just surrounding the parliament on one side, we were crossing both bridges over the Thames and the other side of, of, um, of the Thames. So it's a, it's a, it's a very long um, human chain. So we calculated it would take 5,000 people and it took, well, there was many more, so at least 7,000 people. And then um, Julian was shortlisted for the Sakharov Prize. Uh, which is something unexpected. We were already, you know, calling the, the long list a, a, a great victory, which it was. Um, but then yesterday morning, we found out that he's one of three finalists. Yay! Yeah, so that's that's massive, you know. Um, just the... the... Uh, the contrast, or the... Uh, you have the U.S. wanting to put him in prison for 175 years in the European Parliament, wanting to give him the highest award of human rights and freedom of thought. So that's really uh, where we're at. Things are really stark now. Um, and Ithaca, the film, it's showing tonight uh, for the second night. Um, I think it's not showing anymore. So if you want to catch it after this, uh, go to the Colosseum. Uh, we had a standing ovation there uh, yesterday when it opened and the director of the festival said that this had, was the first time um, she had seen this in, in the five years of the festival has been that has been the five years which that she's been leading the festival she's never seen that before um, I even posted a, a video of the standing ovation because it was really quite moving it just went on and on and then she eventually um, ended it. Uh, and, you know, it, it just keeps on coming and that's what, well, that's what it takes um, to free Julian. We need to uh, just uh, keep going and keep building uh, the support, the movement, the awards, the recognition, the, the denunciation of what's going on until it is politically impossible for this to go through. Because this is, um, it's not a, this is not a case of a, a legal process going through the courts. It's the courts being instrumentalized in order to prolong Julian's imprisonment. And we need to completely uh, retake the, the narrative and the reframing of what's going on. Because what's really going on when, what it really boils down to, 
is that the criminals seized the coercive uh, powers of the state to go after the person who denounced them, right? The one who was trying to bring accountability then became the victim of uh, the abuse of the law and the abuse of the law in order to put him in prison. So it's really about reversing that. Um, they reversed uh, they re reversed the, the perception in relation to Julian by trying to turn him into um, uh, someone who, who uh, is, a, is a, the target of, of um, their, uh, their crimes. Sorry, I'm a bit slow because it's been a long few days. Um, so they reverse the, the reality, now we have to reverse it back uh, to show that he's, uh, that he's the one that did the right thing and they're the ones who are the criminals. And not just criminals for what he exposed, but criminals also because he's, um, because of the measures they've taken against him in the process of his persecution, spying on his lawyers, spying on him, and of course conspiring to murder him, conspiring to kidnap him, conspiring to poison him, and so on. Um, so we need to uh, start calling them what they are, which is they are the criminals, and Julian is the journalist, and Julian stands for truth and justice, and human rights, and rule of law, and they do the opposite. Hi right. Stella, I was quite worried reading the news that uh, Julian obviously has been infected with COVID and I was wondering first uh, how can that happen in a high security prison yeah, that somebody is not safe against COVID first. Then I thought maybe he was infected deliberately. Are there any further information about how he contracted the infection and how he's doing with the infection? So I think you have a microphone that you can speak. All right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I mean, this was a frustration always when through the six or seven months that I, I wasn't able to see Julian during the, um, during the worst part of the, of the pandemic, that Julian was never going to be safe from COVID because in a place like uh, Belmarsh Prison, you have 800 prisoners, but then you also have about 500 staff, people coming in and out all the time, going home, getting infected, and so on. And then when you're moving through the prison, you're moving to holding rooms. So they take you from one place and then they put all the prisoners together, you know, 30, 40 prisoners in one room. You stay there for an hour or two hours while they, you know. So Julian was never safe from, from COVID. You probably got it in a holding room. Um, and he's been in, uh, in lockdown in, uh, in his cell. So he hasn't left his cell since Saturday last week. This is day seven. He's still testing positive as of today. And how is he doing? I mean, is, he, uh, is it a worse kind of infection or is it somehow um, coping? Well, I mean, I, I don't want to go into it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. Um, it seems to me that a source prosecution is like the case to watch in real time the, the collapse and the corruptedness of the UK legal system. Um, you're a lawyer yourself. Um, what, did this, what did this do to your trust in, in the UK legal system and in legal systems in general? Well, I don't think there's any uh any person observing this case, including those with any amount of experience, that aren't constantly shocked by what's going on. Um, 
I mean, since 2010. Uh, uh, if you think about the, for example, when the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention delivered its decision, and Julian went to the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention in 2014, and it took them 16, no, sorry, it took them over a year to do the investigation about this uh, case. And then they finally delivered their decision in February 2016. And of course, um, our expectation, and it's not naive, it wasn't a naive expectation, was that if Julian won, then they would comply with the decision of the working group, because this is the, you know, the peak decision-making body on the issue of arbitrary detention. Um, but what happened? Well, uh, they, they basically behaved like, um, you know, like the worst offenders on arbitrary detention. They, uh, they basically laughed off the, the decision. Um, and it's a, a legally binding decision. It, it relates to their legally binding international obligations. And they just ignored it. So that was a real kind of eye opener on how they were prepared to just uh, hold the, their international obligations, their um, um, yeah, in contempt, in spite, you know, in front of everyone to see. Another example of this was in 2012. There was a. You might remember, Julian went into the embassy on the 19th of June, 2012, and then on the 16th of August, 2012, was when Ecuador announced that they would give him political asylum. So they were considering it for about two months. In this period, uh, there was a lot of intimidation at a diplomatic level from the UK, and at, at one point when Ecuador had announced that they would give their decision, and I guess the UK had intelligence that it would be giving Julian political uh, asylum. Uh, they then threatened to storm the embassy, and Ecuador publicly denounced it, and the whole Latin American bloc came out against it publicly. And then finally, on the 16th of August, it was publicly announced that Julian was now a political asylee at the embassy. And it wasn't just the diplomatic immunity of the embassy that was protecting him, but actually he had a political, uh, a diplomatic internationally recognized status, which he actually had until Ecuador illegally removed it and let him be arrested by UK police. Okay, on the day that Ecuador announced the asylum being granted, there was lots of police outside. It's a very kind of famous image of around the embassy. There was hundreds and hundreds of police and hundreds and hundreds of supporters and, and press and everything. And the press had, you know, these huge lenses. And they managed to take a, a picture of a <coughs> clipboard of one of the police officers. And on that clipboard it said, um, <coughs> arrest Assange even if he has diplomatic immunity, even if he's in a diplomatic car. Basically, the UK was instructing, the UK police was instructed to violate the Geneva, uh, sorry, the Vienna Convention um, in order to get Julian. So this is at this level where they will violate the law and then they will deal with the consequences later. They will argue in court that it's legal or that this, they did it because of this. And, but the priority was to get Julian. Um, so it, it's been like this all the way through, that it's just the political imperative of persecuting Julian um, that has, that is really above the law in their, in their mind, to their mind. Um, and for Julian, it has been a constant struggle to try to get his rights recognized and respected and they have been violated throughout increasingly to such a, a, a grave degree now that you know we're all witnesses to what's going on but it, it's been a process of a decade of constant um, complete uh, disregard and 
outright violation, not only of his rights, but of, you know, um, he's been the victim of, of the gravest possible criminal activity against him. Well, I was wondering how much um, is Julian able to hear and see from what's going on in the world, um, especially if, uh, after, uh, like, now triggered by the war in Ukraine, for example, um, there's ma mass unrest among uh, working people. Uh, and also, I wanted to congratulate uh, you for your appearance uh, against uh, war criminal John Bolton, which was very <laughs> principled and uh, brave, um, and I strongly agree that uh, the reality has to be shown that they are the criminals and uh, not Julian. How much does Julian get to see? Well, not, not much. Um, we. You know, we try to keep him informed about what's what's going on, um, but he can't. Obviously, he has no internet. So sometimes I read him an article that's interesting, or I send it to him, but obviously he gets it after a while. Um, and lots of people write to him, you know, and and um, I encourage people to do that. Um, it's basically what he can. Uh, what could, he can hear from calling me or, or you know, the, the few other people that he can speak to and what people send to him. Uh, but it's, it's only a fraction, obviously. And, you know, it's like the other day when we were at this, uh, surround, this uh, human chain around the parliament and I was trying to convey to him what it was like because, you know, he, he had no images, he had... I just had to kind of describe it to him, but you can't really, because it was just, it was really euphoric there. It was like a tangible um, human solidarity, people coming together where, I think it's also because, you know, we've had Corona and so on, and then there are all these people who support Julian, but they don't necessarily meet each other in person like they interact on Twitter or whatever. But there was this just like camaraderie and it was instant and we had encouraged people to go around um, wearing uh, something yellow to be recognizable to each other. We had told them, oh, there's this pub over here, people are going to go there afterwards and like really encouraging people to interact and it really worked. And, um, and because I was like, you know, 20 minutes before we didn't know if we would get enough people to form the chain and then we did, and more, and everyone could see this. And it was just like, yeah, we, we made it, and everyone knew that they were, uh, they were essential to making the chain longer. So everyone felt like, you know, it's just, uh, it was really exhilarating. And uh, I think everyone who was there kind of came, came out really energized. And I was trying to tell Julian this, but, uh, I did my best to convey it, but in the end, it's like, yeah, it worked, and we had extra people. It was really good, and you know, people were really happy. But he didn't see it, you know, he didn't experience it. Uh, and it's all like that, you know. He's, he's constantly within these four walls, and the his, um, you know, his reality doesn't change. His physical reality doesn't change, and so um, I tried to talk to him about even the most mundane things, you know, I'm just like walking down the street and describing what I'm seeing, so that he can picture it, because after a while, years of being within the four, same four walls or the same corridor, everything starts vanishing, everything else. And it was a little bit like that in the embassy as well. I mean, it was a lot like that, but, but not as, you know, this is, this is something else, so much. Um, but he knows, he knows that things are, you know, that, that, uh, that the support is building and, and he's pleasantly surprised by things like the Sakharov, um, being a Sakharov uh, Prize finalist and this kind of thing. He can tell that it's not just, you know, me trying to keep his hopes up, but actually uh, there's, a, there's a worldwide movement that's coming together. People are really understanding what's at stake, that it's urgent that he is... He needs everyone's help, and, and people are coming out to help. 
Uh, I just wanted to ask you because you mentioned uh, software price. Uh, uh, what does that mean for Assange and also for you, uh, taking account that uh, more likely he will not get it if you see the other shortlisted candidates? Will it change something? It's, it's huge. The Sakharov Prize nomination is huge. And I was actually in, I was in uh, Brussels on Tuesday. Um, and we thought, well, we just have about 24 hours more to talk about the Sakharov Prize because he probably won't make the shortlist. So um, we were there and I was having a, a conversation and there were several MEPs there, so 40 MEPs nominated him. And some of them were saying, well, you know, he, he will never win because the Sakharov Prize has become a symbol of, or it has become a tool of political and diplomatic um, pragmatism, something like that. And my answer was, um, I'm not here with the expectation that Julian will win. I'm here because you nominated him, and that is huge, you know? It's huge, because just the nomination, now the finalist list, it, it um, becomes itself a massive uh, tool for, for me to be able to continue the campaign it raises his political profile, you know, it's not, it's not a fringe issue when you're one of three finalists for the European Parliament's peak human rights and freedom of thought prize. This is not some marginal cause. This is at the center of uh, the political here and now. Um, and no one can deny that. And so every, every um, initiative big and small, actually builds the momentum and the political context that's needed to say, well, actually, uh, Julian's case is constantly being talked about. It's at the center of discussion. You know, um, the other nominees are the people of Ukraine, Zelensky, and um, the Columbia, Columbia Truth Commission. It doesn't matter that he doesn't win. He's one of those three, you know, and uh, it, it allows us to campaign with the broader audience. So, um, yeah, these, these things are never um, futile. Um, and it, it's just like uh, any nomination to, to awards. You put in a nomination and then there's some selection committee there's some kind of process, you know, if it's a serious prize, where they don't just throw it away. They have to read your application. And so that's also a way of, of educating and informing people. Thank you. So actually, uh, this last you said that it's a way of informing people. That's something I wondered about because um, I'm not a person who is active on the internet very much. But I was wondering if there is kind of a document summarizing the facts about Julian's case that then I can physically share with people. Uh, because once you find out the facts, it's really horrifying. <laughs> but it's not necessarily always easy to share chronologically all of the things that you know have happened. And I was just wondering if there is some kind of an official document that one can then just print out and kind of give around? Uh, it depends on who your, who your audience is. So, I mean, just in general, um, Amnesty International, for example, has very strong statements um, as to Reporters Without Borders about this being a political, politically motivated case, and so on. Um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Neil Smeltzer, wrote a whole book about it. Um, and that's, you know, that's the kind of definitive um, deconstruction of the persecution, let's say, to date. Um, there's also another book by Stefania Marizzi. Like, there's, there's a lot of... There's a lot of um, efforts now being made 
uh, by various investigative journalists and filmmakers and so on to break this down. Um, and Ithaca, the film uh, about our, our family's fight for Julian, that's a different approach because the approach to, through the film that's in the Colosseum tonight is actually you don't need to know all the detail about the, the legal case and the political implications and, and the history. You don't need to know that, you just need to know that this is a human being that is suffering, that is being persecuted, that is in prison for years without charge, that has been spied on, that has been uh, the victim of a murder plot, etc. That's a different way. Um, but I think in terms of like the general audience, I do think it's the cultural exposure through films, through art, and so on that, that will uh, overcome this barrier that, oh, it's very complex and I need to, I can't have an opinion on t unless I understand every little minute detail because, um, you know, there's some people who have followed this thing for 12 years and they, <laughs> they have very good episodic memory, but that's not the expectation anyone should have. Um, the case is so outrageous and such a travesty that the, uh, the injustice of it kind of um, stands on its own uh, for, for everyone to see. And I think that's also why people are realizing what's going on because it's, you know, Julian's been in there for soon to be four years. Uh, and he doesn't, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's not, you know, he did everything right. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about your sense of the engagement that the issue is gaining amongst the younger generations. Do you feel it's, it has a good momentum or do you feel there is some obstacles towards point shedding, gaining their attention of younger generations on the issue? Uh, I mean, getting the, the young people involved and aware is really essential. Um, partly because they're not yet compromised by, you know, career pro progression and that kind of thing. Um, but I think we're, I think there's a lot more interest um, now. We're doing a lot more engagement in the UK with, with universities. Um, and I've been doing a, a few podcasts uh, recently. I did one with Russell Brand. I did one with Jordan Peterson. And I'm trying to like bridge different political, um, you know, approaches, because I, I, I do think you need a critical mass of people in order to get Julian free, and for that you need to really go to the, to the core of it, which is left or right, most people agree that truth should not be a crime, that you shouldn't put publishers in prison, that war crimes should be prosecuted, and so on. So it's about um, engaging. I think it's also about finding a discourse of of unity and of which is which is very um, kind of not really um, very descriptive of our times, right? Everything's so polarized, but uh, but there are common grounds, and these are the most important common grounds. And we need to find a, a, a dialogue in which um, we can agree on what the common grounds are. Uh, so, uh, with the young, younger generation, of course, they, they weren't necessarily 
politically aware when WikiLeaks published, you know, evidence of torture and extrajudicial killings and so on. Um, and when you say, well, it was evidence, torture, and extrajudicial killings, it sounds very, very abstract. Uh, whereas WikiLeaks actually reveals the very concrete with details, of dates, and times, and names, and ages, and so on. But how do you summarize that? And I think the, the most effective way has always been um, to screen as often as possible when you're speaking to people about WikiLeaks the collateral murder video. Because a collateral murder video really kind of, people get it when they see it. And Julian is, uh, that Julian is charged with the collateral murder publication. 40, I think it's 40 years, 30 or 40 years of his, um, of the charges relate to the collateral murder publication. That's a whole life sentence just in one, in, in that one publication. And people see it and they're witnessing the slaughter of innocent civilians and, you know, the cold-blooded killing of a man who goes to rescue uh, someone who's, who's critically wounded. Um, so you, you, became, you become a first-hand witness to this war crime. And then you understand, well, actually, hold on, these people who committed the war crime, they're free, they're with their children, they've never had to face a courtroom, they've never been, you know, had to face any consequences for these, for these killings. And Julian, who is the reason you're able to witness that, is the one who's in prison. And I think that's the most immediate and... You know, you don't even have to explain it. Because once you're explaining, it's kind of... Uh, people get it when they see the collateral murder video. You say, the people who did this are free. Julian is in prison. Can, what is Julian charged with in the US? And can he get a fair trial? Uh -huh. In the US. rejecting this question recently because because once you start going into this into the legal process you you buy into the you're legitimizing it as if it were a legal process yeah. but I can explain <laughs> Julian's charged under the US Espionage Act 17 counts each count car carries um, 10 years and then five years under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act charge is just like the PR um, glazing. Uh, it's, it's a completely bogus, made-up charge. Um, the essence of it is that they claim that Julian, or someone they say was Julian, some, an anonymous account in an encrypted chat, agreed to try to help Chelsea Manning hide her identity. That's the charge. That's the computer charge. Um, which is, by the way, complete bogus from a technical perspective. Uh, and then the 17 charges, they tried to beef it up later with a... Anyway, there was a later indictment where they tried to beef up the computer charge um, by introducing a new star witness, the star witness uh, so, so called um, is a convicted pedophile, diagnosed psychopath by by a court in Iceland, um, who who later recanted his testimony and said what the U.S. put in their final indictment um, is bogus and um, <coughs> recanted his testimony. So the seventeen charges relate to receiving, possessing, and communicating information to the public. And that information related to the wars in Afghanistan, the wars in Iraq, the Guantanamo Bay prison camp, torture camp, uh, the US diplomatic cables, which were all, they're not all, they're not all printed out there, it's just the secret ones. Um, 
that are printed out, 250,000 of them, uh, which detailed U.S. Uh, subversion of the judiciary here in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, in relation to the um, U.S. CIA uh, rendition flights where people were plucked out of Europe or flown through Europe in order to be tortured in black sites. Um, so the, the charges, the 170 years under the Espionage Act, concern journalistic activity because everyone, well, most people know that the source was Chelsea Money. And um, the U.S. is trying to construe communication with the source, or alleged, communicating, alleged communication with the source, as a conspiracy to publish. I mean, think about it. Um, just receiving information is a crime. Just possessing that information is a crime. Even if you were to take away the actual publication charges, but communi communicating, which are 30 years, you're still left with 140 years for receiving and possessing. Imagine that he hadn't published. They could still go after him for 140 years. The case is absolutely um, beyond absurd. And um, it's kind of uh, North Korea-like when you think about it. Uh, but as I said, even going into it kind of let, lends it some kind of credence. There's no, um, there's no public interest defense in, in the Espionage Act because you're talking about a piece of legislation from 1917 that was, was well, very broadly worded, but if you have an Espionage Act, supposedly for espionage, and that's not what Julian's accused of in, in relation, like, they're not accusing him of espionage as you usually understand espionage, but the act is called the Espionage Act. It's very broadly worded, so they can repurpose it for whatever um, mad reason um, they decide in relation to journalism, because it is so vague and broadly worded. Uh, so there's no public interest defense. That, that's to say, if Julian stands trial, he's not able to say, well, you see, I did receive and possess and communicate this information to the public, but I did it because it was a war crime. Or I did it because it, it uh, documented um, the civilian killings of 10 to 15,000 people in Iraq. Or I did it because... Um, because these people deserve justice, and so on. Uh, you can't argue that, because it makes no difference. It makes no difference to whether he's, um, to, to his defense, because you cannot mount a defense. It's kind of automatic. You received it, you possessed it, you communicated it, you're, you're guilty. And no national security defendant has, has ever won a case in that court. And of course you have the plea bargain system anyway. Um, so, look, Julian can't ever receive a fair trial in the U.S. because he's not even a U.S. citizen. Like, what are we even talking about? Is the whole of the world under U.S. jurisdiction? I mean, that's what they want, and that's what the U.K. is playing along with. But if, if the U.S. is allowed to do that, then, um, there is no, there is no jurisdiction to speak of as, uh, in, as far as the press is concerned, um, there is no press freedom. If the US is able to do this in the UK or in Germany or whatever, um, then the press is, all the safeguards for the press just fall away. And then Turkey or somewhere else will say, well that's a very good idea, we should go after, you know, a, a German journalist publishing in France or Germany or whatever, because you know they're paid. There are no there are no boundaries anymore. They violated our secrecy laws because we don't like that published in Germany. Let's extradite him and or her and put them in prison for the rest of their lives. It's completely absurd.
you're on the front line of defending press freedom. Um, how much support did you actually get from, from other news outlets that WikiLeaks collaborated with? Well, by the way, if you have any questions about the Espionage Act, you have a, an expert here in the front row, Joe Lario, who's uh, very knowledgeable and has written lots of very helpful articles about it. Put your hand up, Joe. There he is. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, support from... Well, they've done the bare minimum. Like, they're basically on the, on the right side of history in terms of they put out an editorial saying this shouldn't be happening and it's an attack on press freedom. But I mean, frankly, they should be doing a lot more. Um, at a minimum, and this is something that someone recently said, at a minimum, they should be putting out a joint statement saying Assange should be released and this whole case should be dropped a joint statement from the five original partners. This is like super easy and <laughs> obvious, especially because they've already said it shouldn't be going on. Um, you know, the problem is, I think there's some uh, shame and embarrassment by uh, some of the publications, or, yeah. Um, so they'd rather not put themselves in the spotlight. Especially, well, I won't. The Guardian. Yeah, the Guardian. Um, I mean, the, the thing is, if the press, especially the, 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 one, the ones who were the working most closely in relation to these publications that published the same material that could be prosecuted on the same grounds. If they had behaved any differently, if they had actually behaved critically, reporting critically over what's happened, what happened over the past 12 years, from the beginning, I'm convinced that Julian would not have spent a single day in jail. Not a single day. And every day that passes is a failure by the press, by those specific publications, I'm doing the right thing. My question goes somehow a bit in the same direction. I just wanted to ask you if you could maybe name some people you got in touch for to get support for your course, but who denied it to you, like relevant people, maybe the President of the European Commission or someone. Because the names, Mrs. It Adrian. could be that <laughs> someone wants to send some emails here or do anything like activate himself or herself for supporting you in this thing. like. It's not the best diplomatic approach to get people on board. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, the thing, it's a bit of a, no, but it's, it's a bit of a luxury to do that. Because Julian's fate is in the hands of people actually coming together and doing what they haven't done so far. And... Uh, it's not a good strategy to, for me, uh, but I mean, it's obvious who was in a position to do something about it or to do more about it than they're actually doing. And I know there are people who are calling out those people, but um, it's much more appealing for people who are in those positions to feel welcome to join and, and that they will be, uh, they will join the, the stride um, without attack. And that's what's needed really, is um, open arms. And once Julian's out, you know, <laughs> we can dissect things, but I don't think that it doesn't matter anymore because then Julian will be out, right? So we have to kind of try to build a, a, a positive movement that's not. And I know I've done a bit of that, so I shouldn't. Um, it's a bit difficult, though. Okay, uh, Stella, this is about the Espionage Act, but I'm sure Joe 
would be just as curious to know the answer as I am. Um, so there have been some wonderful changes proposed to the Espionage Act by Rashida Talib and uh, Ilan Omar, members of the squad. Um, and so, in particular, uh, they try to redefine it and narrow the terms so it's less broad. So there has to be specific intent to harm national security. And also, material must have been properly classified, which wouldn't be the case. It couldn't be the case if it were a war crime. So I just wondered if, if either of those had got in contact with the, the WikiLeaks legal team and if there was any chance that that might relate to Julian's case or is it more likely it relates to Trump, Trump's case? Although they're, they're Dems. So I just wondered if they had got in contact with you and if you had any news of whether where that's going. Um. I mean, I have no doubt that any any proposed amendment to the Espionage Act has as its um, as a da backdrop the outrageous abuse of the Espionage Act in Julian's case. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, this is the most well apart from yeah, apart from the Trump whatever. Um, but in terms of press freedom, this is the obvious. Um, you know, reference. Uh, in terms of uh, the US context, there's, I mean, yeah, I don't want to say too much. Okay. Now, one thing I'm just struck by, by you and the whole family, um, and you can see it in the film Africa, you know, as you say, they don't even need to explain too much. It probably takes about a minute of the film's time, actually, these details of what it means to press freedom. Really, the sense you get uh, around Julian is there are people with great solidarity and incredible love and um, resilience and caring for uh, others. And uh, that this tells us so much about who Julian is which has been lost in the narratives, the smears that have been thrown up to try to, you know, put him where he is to silence him and stop us knowing what's going on, the criminality. Um, but my question relates to how do you and how does, you know, maybe yourself, but I see it in John as well, um, able to keep going in the face of this incredible injustice, um, which is just, you know, really so profound <clears throat> on a personal and historic front, you know, but how do you keep stride and keep poise? And like you say, it doesn't actually help to sort of be pointing fingers and although it might be tempting, very tempting. Uh, but as you say, it doesn't, it doesn't actually get you what you want, does it? So yeah, how do you, how do you deal with this? And, and yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the fighting, the fighting for Julian part is, is the easy part. You know, I just, uh, there's a lot of interest, um, and you know, you, you just keep pushing, and um, and there are a lot of people that want to help, you know, all over the place, and just in terms of apart from the like any physical uh, limitations, which so far I've I've managed to. Uh, dodge them, more or less, you know, I get sick now and then, and kind of bit obviously tired today, but um, the fighting for Julian part is easy, because, you know, I just want him to be free, and that's, you don't, you don't need, you don't need any further mo motivation than that. Um, but it's, you know, it's hard, because, uh, the hard bit is sometimes you feel like um, sometimes you're dealing with actual psychopaths, you know, um, and, and that's not the majority. I mean, I'm talking, and I'm not really affected by the Twitter 
you know, trolls and so on. But they exist, you know, and then that's also like, okay, you're just trying to do, <laughs> you're just trying to um, communicate uh, the importance of the case and this kind of thing. But then you're met with some people who are actually um, extremely just psychologically bizarre. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I mean, I guess that's that's kind of the the nature of of uh, engaging publicly with the public or with maybe people who are posing as a public, right? Uh, but I mean, I'm not really that affected by it because I've seen the kind of extraordinary vitriol and concerted attacks and planted stories against Julian. I saw that for years, and I mean, it's like I I know what I'm. I know what I'm dealing with, um, or what Julian's dealing with. So it's um, it's kind of okay. So like the whole CIA operation inside the embassy. Like some people are like, "Oh my God, what's it like?" You know, finding out that they were trying to steal the DNA of your of your child's nappy and um, knowing that they were plotting to assassinate him and these things. The thing is, I knew, I kind of, I didn't know, like in detail, I didn't have, we didn't have the Spanish whistleblowers and we didn't have this 7,000 word investigation that was published last year. I didn't know that in 2018 or in December 2017, but I could sense it, like I could just, you know, that environment was extreme. It was extreme, and it came as, of course they were doing that, because I could feel it, because we could feel it in there. Um, so, it's a relief that we can say it, that we can discuss it here today. And imagine those whistleblowers hadn't come out, and that CIA investigation hadn't been published. I would be here saying, like, we were in there, and it felt like they were going to kill him any time. You know, and you'd be like, well, she's obviously a little bit affected by the situation, but it can't be like that extreme. Well, actually, yes, yeah. So in a way, it's, it's a relief that I can speak to you without feeling like there's a barrier of my reality and yours, because you are actually receptive to my, what I've been through, what we've been through, what Julian's, what's being done to Julian, because over time these things have been coming out. The real, the real difficulty was when we were living it, and there was um, kind of a business as usual. Oh well, you know, he's just—it's all in his head. The U.S. is fine. The U.K. is behaving normally. He can step out any time he likes. Right? That, mm -hmm. that phrase. And it was like a complete dis like my reality and what I saw. There was just a complete um, uh, dis not a, even a disconnect. It was like I saw the I saw the world through what I could see. <laughs> anyway, I, it, it, sometimes it, it, it feels like. Um, cognitive dissonance. Sorry. A cognitive dissonance. A juxtaposition. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's much more that, than that. Um, yeah, it's very, very strange. But I don't feel that anymore. So. Um, hello, and uh, thank you for letting me ask this question. I I am interested foremost if as you had said before what has happened so far about Lopez Obrador's proposal of uh, asylum and citizenship so far I think it has been reiterated a couple of times and the presidency of Mexico has said they were um, at least in contact with the legal committee. So what could you tell us whether it's actually feasible or 
Well, what do you think about the Mexican asylum proposal? Well, this is... Uh, these initiatives are incredibly politically important. Mexico is a major international player, um, and especially for the United States. So, and it's not just a, you know, it's not just a, a motion. Uh, it's a very overt um, show of support. And because this is a political case, these kinds of uh, this kind of thing is really significant. I don't, you know, I don't, um, I don't want to comment too much on that, but um, I think it's hugely significant that that Mexico, that the Mexican president is prepared to do that because he doesn't have to, and that's has a, a major impact for Julian politically. Um, and there's other, you know, there's other support in, from other Latin American countries and Lula, if he becomes president again, uh, will obviously be a very heavy weight in the region as well. Um, he's already said Julian should win the Nobel Peace Prize and that he's a political prisoner and so on. He said these things in the past, recent past. Um, yeah. I have one, I and many people in this room, including as far from New Zealand and all over, have been with you at the Sran Parliament and uh, well, I came back the next day and I wondered what um, and what took this, and if the British media took up this huge manifestation, and what kind of, or how did they um, report on it, be it uh, press, uh, print media, or television? There were some reports. I mean, look. Yeah, there were some reports with, uh, actually the Daily Mail, the Sunday, the Mail on Sunday, reported 7,000 people, and it was a positive report. Um, there were several others that took up a, a wire report that said hundreds of, <laughs> hundreds of protesters, which is mathematically impossible, because you can't surround that area with any less than 5,000 um, and there were many more, so... Um, uh, you know what, it, it's just... I just don't, you know... To a degree, I feel like, yeah, we can complain about the media, but how much does it really matter? You had 7,000 people there. You had word of mouth. You had their awareness that it was a success. Um, the impact of that is huge. You had the people watching it. You had the police seeing that actually we set out to do it and we achieved it uh, and more. You have um, all the media I was able to do in the lead up to it because those opportunities, the press or podcasts, um, the Russell Brand one I did, the Piers Morgan, um, and a few others, they only came up because we were doing the human chain, because that was the hook. Uh, so, you know, all the day, yeah, they reported, some reported about it, some didn't, or they played it down. But in general, <coughs> it was okay. It was, you know, it wasn't a total blackout. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that we made it. 
um, lots of people were filming, um, and uh, and now we can say we, you know, we, it had never been done before, and it was huge, huge achievement. Um, and there was a transport strike, like, <laughs> yeah, against all odds, we, you know, exceeded all expectations. So it's just about building that and the press also follows you know the press follows the mood as well they, they follow things like political signaling what do the powerful you know interests where do they lie I'm not saying they always just side with those but they're responsive they have their ear to the ground and having their ear to the ground also means um seeing that there's a, actually a very strong movement for Julian. That's, that has also huge significance. And it has, um, it leads to other things. So it's not about the media's coverage on the day, although it could have been better. Um, <coughs> lots of people don't even look at the media. They don't read newspapers, they, you know. It's not insignificant, but I mean, I don't think that that's not like the main purpose. Hello, uh, Mrs. Assange. It's awesome to have you here, and uh, thank you for all the work that you do for your, not just for your husband, but for all our all freedom. Um, I was uh, you uh, earlier. You said you encourage people to uh, send mail to Assange, and I wanted to ask you. What's Assange's favorite mail? Like, is it poems or drawings or like, I don't know, nice, nice words? And where can we send? Like, how can we send this to? Is it to the address of the prison and then to his name or? Yeah. There's a there's a website called writejulian.com that has all the instructions about how to write to Julian. Um, most I think most of his mail gets through. Uh, Although he does, there are bags of mail that don't. <coughs> uh, but generally, I think he, he gets most of it. Um, what does he like? He likes. Um, sometimes he reads me the letters that he gets. Like if he like, he has one that he, I don't know. Um, but I, I shouldn't try to be prescriptive. <laughs> If I say he likes this, then you're all going to do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, he likes reading interesting articles about things that don't necessarily have to do about do with his case. Um, you know, <coughs> science, culture, whatever. Because uh, sometimes, yeah, it's a it's a relief for him to. <coughs> read about other things that are interesting. Um, so, yeah. If you look at the persecution of Julian and try are uh, trying to locate the source, where it comes from, then you can go to Washington, D.C., to the Department of Justice, because they could drop the indictments, the three indictments, and the whole thing, story would be over, he would be free. Have you got any assessments, informations, rumors, or whatever, if the Department of Justice might be rethinking the fact that they just took over the point of view of Mike Pompeo, Trump, and all these guys, and just are persecuting? Uh, uh, Julian, like the Obama administration, did not do. Well, this case is a huge, <coughs> it's hugely controversial, and that is an. Uh, that's an opportunity. It was controversial throughout, during the Obama administration, during the Trump administration as well. Two of the lead prosecutors were taken off the case because they disagreed with the Espionage Act charges. Um, and now during the Biden administration, we know that for a fact that the, that the, con the, per the prosecution itself is controversial within this administration. There's disagreement within the DOJ. So what what does it take? I think it takes, it just takes political cover. It takes 
enough political pressure for there to be a uh, to, to get it over the line. Because, I mean, staying this course is also difficult for them. So it's about making it more difficult than the opposite. And, uh, and that's why you need a concerted effort on all fronts. So you have the Australian government now, which says that it is trying to do something. Um, I mean, the Australian government is, I think, a very important piece to this. Um, but at the same time, you need the press saying, well, enough is enough. This is outrageous. This has gone on for too long. This is almost four years. The case is outrageous. It affects us and so on. Um, you need the, the public to say, uh, we now understand what has been going on and he has to be freed and this is a political prisoner um, at every level of society. That's what, and you know, politicians, they just respond to what they think will get them reelected. That's really quite simple. They're very vulnerable and constantly, they're constantly uh, paranoid about losing their power, right? So it's just uh, making them aware that this is an issue for their own political career. Uh, but really, I don't think the, the DOJ needs much convincing. They know what the problems are with this case. Uh, but the, there needs to be enough political pressure for them to be able to say, well, we reviewed it, and actually this was a bad thing from the Trump era. Yeah. Stella, so... Um Right now, Julian's applied for the permission to appeal to the High Court, mm. which is a weird English thing. You have to ask permission for an appeal. It's not a right given to you. Um, if, can you tell us what are the prospects, what comes next, next in a, a, you know, a conservative... Uh, Expectation, what's the risks? Um, where, where, did, where is this case going? Well, the risks are that the UK High Court has no obligation to hear this appeal. And they could just say, well, we're not going to hear it, and he's going to get extradited. And that could happen technically, you know, by Christmas. And this is uh, the urgency of getting him out. Um, is because we need to, you know, because this, because there's no timeline that we control and that things could just go catastrophically um, any time. I mean, every day that Julian's in prison, his life is at risk. So we have to get him out, like, yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that has to be the, you know, that, that's why I kind of reject this. Okay, we're, otherwise we're trailing after a, you know, dates of hearings and this kind of thing. And that gives you the false illusion that the legal process is legitimate and that we have to somehow track what's going on in the, in the, in the, through the courts. Whereas what's going through the courts is prolonging his imprisonment. And there has to be a completely a political mobilization centered on he should be out yesterday. Where is out? Out to where? Out to where? Mm -hmm. Out to wherever he's safe. Which is? Which is? Which is? <laughs> well, Julian's a finalist for the Sakharov Prize. You know, if when speaking to those MEPs the other day, it's like, you know, that kind of thing gives political protection. Um, so do embassies. Sorry? So do embassies sometimes, right? But not always. I mean, 
if Julian is freed, yeah, of course, you know, he's, he's, there's always a risk, but Julian being freed is a huge win, a huge political win. It won't just save his life, but it is in itself protective. At the moment, they're, they're winning because they've silenced him. They've silenced him for four years, longer. 23rd, sorry, 28th of March, 2018. That's when Ecuador said, you don't speak or we throw you out of the embassy. That was a whole year before he was arrested. The UK authorities have disappeared him. He can't even go to court because they don't want him photographed going into court. He can't attend his own hearings, except through a, a video feed. We're going to take one more question. Alex? Yeah, pass the microphone down. We're, we're streaming. Oh, sorry. Alex. We're streaming and recording, so if you don't mind. Thank you, Stella. Um, I was just wondering if all that's needed or required of the Australian Prime Minister is to just record, just say that we want him home, or what's the, the process, and is it as simple as that, or it must be more, much more complicated, but what's the, the chances of that happening? So. Well, basically, yes. I mean, they're, they're, the, Australian, the Australian government is a, is a close ally of the US um, and strategically very significant in geopolitical terms. And what do we know about the previous government? We know that um, Scott Morrison, the previous prime minister, had weekly phone calls with Mike Pompeo. Mike Pompeo who was plotting to assassinate Julian. Here you have a different uh, you have a different public position from the Australian government and all they need to do is to find a way to unlock it. And it's not like the Australian government is um, a newbie to these things. Like they got um, Melinda Taylor out of um, Libya. They got, uh, I forget the name, the journalist out of Egypt. Um, they, they're, they're constantly um, negotiating Kylie Moore Gilbert out of Iran. You know, they're actually quite experienced in this kind of thing. Uh, so it, it should be a lot easier with an ally. And, you know, Scott Morrison's um, election was also run with him making these statements about Julian, as were other politicians who got elected. So this is actually a promise they've made that they're going to get him out. And the Australian press and population has to keep on badgering them that they said they would get him out. And he's not out yet. Why is he not out yet? Um, and that just has to keep, keep going. Because of course, you know, Scott Morrison can say, Sorry, Scott Morrison. Albanese can say, um, "Look, I know we're friends and so on, but you know, I have my own, I have my own political dynamics at home, and I, you know, I, I'm getting a lot of pressure on this Assange issue, and like, can you speed it up? You know, <coughs> but that's they're close. Of course, Australia. Australia has this kind of 
problem that it has this attitude like it's insignificant. And it's just incredible. Because, and it's a bit like, I mean, I don't want to talk down on the European Parliament, but when they were like, well, it's just, you know, it was like I was sitting there and I was thinking, they don't realize how powerful they are. And it's the same with Australia. Australia is incredibly um, influential and, and important to the US. And if they make it important for, for them, then they can solve it. And um, every day that passes that Julian is free, is, is not free, is a day that they have failed that promise. And that just has to, that just has to keep being you know, put in front of them constantly. Thank you very much, Stella. Okay. Sorry. Give it up for Stella. Sorry.